The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Dan Friedel and Katie Weaver report on weight loss drugs that may risk complications under anesthesia. That is because the weight loss drugs cause people to hold food in their stomachs longer than usual. Faith Perlow has this week's Ask a Teacher on the difference between the words descent and ancestry. Faith and Dan Novak then discuss their own ancestral backgrounds. Later, we listen to part two of Paul's Case by Willa Cather. But first... Doctors who practice anesthesiology in the United States and Canada are expressing concern about patients who take popular weight loss drugs leading up to surgery. Anesthesiologists work together with surgeons to make sure their patients are asleep or sedated before medical procedures. More and more people are taking the weight loss drugs Ozempic and Wegovy. Anesthesiologists say they are having trouble deciding when surgeries should take place. That is because the weight loss drugs cause people to hold food in their stomachs longer than usual. People who still have food in their stomachs when they are put to sleep before surgery risk a complication known as a pulmonary aspiration. That is the term for when someone breathes some of their stomach contents into their lungs. In extreme cases, the food particles can cause infection or even death. Most patients are told to not eat for about eight hours before surgery. However, the doctors say those guidelines may need to be changed for patients who are using the weight loss drugs. Ayan Hobai is an anesthesiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He said everyone who takes the drugs should know about such a serious sort of potential complication. Komodo Health is a technology company that works in healthcare. According to its research, nearly 6 million prescriptions for the weight loss drugs were written in the first five months of 2023. In June, the American Society of Anesthesiologists said patients should not take daily weight loss medications on the day of surgery. It also advised that patients should not get their weekly weight loss injection for a week before any sedation procedures. Dr. Michael Champeau is the head of the organization. He said the recommendation is based on experiences from anesthesiologists around the United States. A group of anesthesiologists, including Hobai, said they would recommend even more time off from the drugs before surgery. In the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia, they suggested about three weeks. Dr. Philip Jones is an anesthesiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. After three weeks, he said, the drug should no longer be affecting the stomach. At that point, he said, everything should go back to normal. Hobai said he is finishing a study of 200 patients who were using drugs such as Ozempic and Wegovy 
before surgery. He said his results are similar to a smaller study in Brazil that found 25% of patients still had food in their stomachs 10 days after stopping the drug. Because of this information, the American Society of Anesthesiologists said doctors who are unsure of their patients' stomach contents should work differently. They say doctors should work as they would if they knew the patient's stomach was full. Aspiration only happens one time out of every 2,000 to 3,000 operations that require sedation. But when it does happen, the patients develop a lung injury half the time. That is why the doctors are concerned. One of Hobai's patients who had been taking Wigovi developed a problem that required serious care. He had not eaten for 18 hours before surgery. In another case, a woman taking a small amount of Ozempic did not eat for 10 hours before surgery. She was in the middle of a procedure that had to be stopped because doctors saw food in her stomach. Dr. Elisa Lund is an anesthesiologist at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She said many doctors have similar stories, as the weight loss drugs have become more common. It has exponentially increased, she said. Novo Nordisk is the drug company that makes Wagovi and Ozempic. The company said there was nothing in its testing that showed the drug would lead to aspiration. However, the drug maker did say the medications can cause the stomach to empty more slowly. Hobai said he is also concerned about patients going off their medications for too long. For example, the drugs are used to control the blood sugar level of patients with diabetes. If they stop taking them before surgery, they may face a different kind of health problem. He said patients who are using the drugs should tell their doctors about them and discuss the risks of having surgery. If you're taking this drug, and you need an operation, you will need to have some extra precautions, he said. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. Ask a teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between descent and ancestry. Dear friends, my name is Karim. I am 53 years old, and I am from Uzbekistan. I have been learning English on my own for three years. Although I cannot speak yet, I like learning English, reading books, and listening to your podcasts. I would like to ask about the difference between descent and ancestry. Thanks a lot for your help and support. Karim Thank you for writing to us, Karim. Keep up the good work learning English with us. This is a great question. A few months ago, I wrote about heritage and inheritance. These words are related to Karim's question. Let's start with descent. 
Descent is a noun that means a person's family, social status, ethnicity, or origin. We usually use it with an adjective that describes a person's background. She is of Irish descent. Bo's family of Cajun descent is from the state of Louisiana. Another noun descendant is connected to descent. It means a person in a family line that stretches from earlier generations to the present one. The United States' fourth president, James Madison, had no direct descendants. Both words come from the verb descend. To descend means to come from a family line or group. There is a theory that birds descended from dinosaurs. Descend also means to go or come down from a higher place. Let's move on to ancestry. Ancestry is a noun that also means a person's ethnic origin or their family members from past to present. For example, I am American because I was born in the United States. But my great-grandfather was from Italy. I have Italian ancestry. We can use the word ancestry as a synonym or a word that has the same meaning for descent. A recent study has shown that many people of Puerto Rico still have Taino ancestry. Another noun we use is ancestor. Your ancestors are the people from whom you descended. In many religions and cultures, ancestors hold a special place and are honored in ceremonies. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Karim. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. That was this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back to the show, Faith. Hi, Dan. This week, we learned the differences between the words descent and ancestry. You mentioned in the story that you have Italian ancestry. Do you have any other ancestry? I do. While my father's side of my family is mostly Italian, hence my last name of Perlo, I have German, Dutch, and Irish, too. I was looking at an article recently with data about where Americans say their families have descended from. I am from West Virginia, and I was rather surprised to see that mix of ancestry of German, Dutch, Irish, and Italian as some of the most common ancestry in West Virginia. Some people in West Virginia also say that they have British, Native American, and even Scottish ancestry. And there are some who say they simply have American ancestry. And that is very common because many Americans do not know their ancestry or who they are descended from. Do you know about your ancestry, Dan? My dad's side of the family is Czech, and my mom's side is Polish and Russian Ashkenazi Jew. That's very cool, Dan. That explains your last name of Novak. I think the article only had data for Polish ancestry. States like Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, and even Connecticut have the most Americans who identify as having Polish ancestry. Are you from any of those states, Dan? I'm not. I'm from Maryland, which does have a high number of Jewish Americans, though. That was an interesting discussion, Faith. Thanks for having me back. Thank you. 
VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Today, we complete the story, Paul's Case. It was written by Willa Cather. Here is Kay Gallant with the story. Paul was a student with a lot of problems. He hated school. He didn't like living with his family on Cordelia Street in the industrial city of Pittsburgh. Paul wanted to be surrounded by beautiful things. He loved his part-time job as an usher at the concert hall. He helped people find their seats before the concert. Then he could listen to the music and dream of exciting places. Paul also spent a lot of time at the local theater. He knew many of the actors who worked there. He used to do little jobs for them, and they would let him see plays for free. Paul had little time left for his studies, so he was always in trouble with his teachers. Finally, Paul's teachers complained again to his father. His father took him out of school and made him take a job in a large company. He would not let Paul go near the concert hall or the theater. Paul did not like his job as a messenger boy. He began to plan his escape. A few weeks later, Paul's boss, Mr. Denny, gave Paul a large amount of money to take to the bank. He told Paul to hurry because it was Friday afternoon. He said the bank would close soon and would not open again until Monday. At the bank, Paul took the money out of his pocket. It was $5,000. Paul put the money back in his coat pocket, and he walked out of the bank. He went to the train station and bought a one-way ticket for New York City. That afternoon, Paul left Pittsburgh forever. The train traveled slowly through a January snowstorm. The slow movement made Paul fall asleep. The train whistle blew just as the sun was coming up. Paul awoke, feeling dirty and uncomfortable. He quickly touched his coat pocket. The money was still there. It was not a dream. He really was on his way to New York City with $5,000 in his pocket. Finally, the train pulled into Central Station. Paul walked quickly out of the station and went immediately to an expensive clothing store for men. The salesman was very polite when he saw Paul's money. Paul bought two suits, several white silk shirts, some silk ties of different colors. Then he bought a black tuxedo suit for the theater, a warm winter coat, a red bathrobe, and the finest silk underclothes. He told the salesman he wanted to wear one of the new suits and the coat immediately. The salesman bowed and smiled. Paul then took a taxi to another shop 
where he bought several pairs of leather shoes and boots. Next, he went to the famous jewelry store, Tiffany's, and bought a tie pin and some brushes with silver handles. His last stop was a luggage store where he had all his new clothes put into several expensive suitcases. It was a little before one o'clock in the afternoon when Paul arrived at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. The doorman opened the hotel's glass doors for Paul, and the boy entered. The thick carpet under his feet had the colors of a thousand jewels. The lights sparkled from crystal chandeliers. Paul told the hotel clerk he was from Washington, D.C. He said his mother and father were arriving in a few days from Europe. He explained he was going to wait for them at the hotel. In his dreams, Paul had planned this trip to New York a hundred times. He knew all about the Waldorf Astoria, one of New York's most expensive hotels. As soon as he entered his rooms, he saw that everything was perfect, except for one thing. He rang the bell and asked for fresh flowers to be sent quickly to his rooms. When the flowers came, Paul put them in water, and then he took a long, hot bath. He came out of the bathroom wearing the red silk bathrobe. Outside his windows, the snow was falling so fast that he could not see across the street. But inside, the air was warm and sweet. He lay down on the sofa in his sitting room. It had all been so very simple, he thought. When they had shut him out of the theater and the concert hall, Paul knew he had to leave. But he was surprised that he had not been afraid to go. He could not remember a time when he had not been afraid of something, even when he was a little boy. But now he felt free. He wasn't afraid anymore. He watched the snow until he fell asleep. It was four o'clock in the afternoon when Paul woke up. He spent nearly an hour getting dressed. He looked at himself often in the mirror. His dark blue suit fit him so well that he did not seem too thin. The white silk shirt and the blue and lilac tie felt cool and smooth under his fingers. He was exactly the kind of boy he had always wanted to be. Paul put on his new winter coat and went downstairs. He got into a taxi and told the driver to take him for a ride along Fifth Avenue. Paul stared at the expensive stores. As the taxi stopped for a red light, Paul noticed a flower shop. Through the window, he could see all kinds of flowers. Paul thought the violets, roses, and lilies of the valley looked even more lovely because they were blooming in the middle of winter. Paul began to feel hungry, so he asked the taxi driver to take him back to the hotel. As he entered the dining room, the music of the hotel orchestra floated up to greet him. He sat at a table near a window. The fresh flowers, the white tablecloth, and the colored wine glasses pleased Paul's eyes. The soft music, the low voices of the people around him, and the soft popping of champagne corks 
whispered into Paul's ears. This is what everyone wants, he thought. He could not believe he had ever lived in Pittsburgh on Cordelia Street. That belonged to another time and place. Paul lifted the crystal glass of champagne and drank the cold, precious, bubbling wine. He belonged here. Later that evening, Paul put on his black tuxedo and went to the opera. He felt perfectly at ease. He had only to look at his tuxedo to know he belonged with all the other beautiful people in the opera house. He didn't talk to anyone, but his eyes recorded everything. Paul's golden days went by without a shadow. He made each one as perfect as he could. On the eighth day after his arrival in New York, he found a report in the newspaper about his crime. It said that his father had paid the company the $5,000 that Paul had stolen. It said Paul had been seen in a New York hotel and it said Paul's father was in New York. He was looking for Paul to bring him back to Pittsburgh. Paul's knees became weak. He sat down in a chair and put his head in his hands. The dream was ended. He had to go back to Cordelia Street back to the yellow-papered bedroom, the smell of cooked cabbage, the daily ride to work on the crowded streetcars. Paul poured himself a glass of champagne and drank it quickly. He poured another glass and drank that one, too. Paul had a taxi take him out of the city and into the country. The taxi left him near some railroad tracks. Paul suddenly remembered all the flowers he had seen in a shop window his first night in New York. He realized that by now, every one of those flowers was dead. They had had only one splendid moment to challenge winter. A train whistle broke into Paul's thoughts. He watched as the train grew bigger and bigger. As it came closer, Paul's body shook. His lips wore a frightened smile. Paul looked nervously around as if someone might be watching him. When the right moment came, Paul jumped. And as he jumped, he realized his great mistake. The blue of the ocean and the yellow of the desert flashed through his brain. He had not seen them yet. There was so much he had not seen. Paul felt something hit his chest. He felt his body fly through the air far and fast, then everything turned black and Paul dropped back into the great design of things. You have just heard the American story, Paul's Case. It was written by Willa Cather. Your storyteller was Kay Gallant. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.